very much again. And thank you also to the Midday Rotary Club for allowing us to be part of today's presentation. So, you know, my name is Carla Cadena. I'm currently the Director of Operations from Hospice Care by Mitigare Cuidados Paliativos. And you need to know that five years ago, I didn't know what hospice was, what in Spanish Cuidados Paliativos was. But once I understood what it was about, what was the purpose of that, and how it is in our country, I decided to, to join the team, to join this great experience, and to work very hard every day to achieve very giant goals, not only San Miguel, but the state and also the country. You will hear more about that today. So now I will introduce my team in order of participation. Lee Carter has been involved in bringing hospice in Mexico for the last 15 years, only 15 years. <laughs> He was a founder of Hospice San Miguel, which later evolved into Mitigare Cuidados Paliativos. And as you know, he's a leader in several Rotary and many other projects around San Miguel de Allende. Dr. Maria Lourdes Tejeda, known as Dr. Lulu or Dr. Tejeda, is the executive and medical director in Mitigare Cuidados Paliativos. She is a certified palliative care specialist, trained at the National Institute of Cancer from Mexico City. In addition to hospice care, Dr. Tejeda is an avid trained as, and has thought hospice and palliative care throughout Mexico. With a master's degree in public health and health administration from the National Institute of Public Health. Additionally, she is a trained trainer from the ELNEC program. ELNEC is the End of Life Nursing and Education Consortium. And she was also named as an activist of the year in 2022 by the NGO office from San Miguel de Allende, and she also had a state nomination last year from Women Who Changed the World Award. <laughs> Les Matthews is our current president for, for Hospice Care by Mitigare Cuevos Paliativos. He has had extensive experience as a partner in five hospices in the Midwest and Southwest in the United States. And he's also a men member of the board of directors from the Hospice Care for Kansas City. So this is my team. I hope that you can learn a lot. At the end, we will have a time for questions and answers and enjoy the presentation. I'm back. Uh, thank you all very much for this opportunity. Uh, our theme today is whether you, as an expat, can reasonably choose to uh, make Mexico the place that you die. Uh, is it visible or viable? Is it messy? Is it complicated? Can you receive the same quality of care medicine, skilled medical expertise as you might expect to receive in the US or Canada? I hope we're gonna answer those questions. I'm gonna talk a little about the logistics and administration of dying in San Miguel. And then Dr. Tejeda is gonna talk about medical care, the evolution of hospice, and what you can expect if you stay here at the end of your life. Uh, but first of all, I'm inspired by Dorothy's comments this morning. and. I'm inspired by Rotary. Uh, Rotary is amazing, and a lot of the impact and a lot of what Rotary does is in the background, and you don't know about it. But I want to tell you what Rotary has done for hospice in Mexico, and specifically here in San Miguel. Uh, hospice San Miguel was founded in 2006. It was the first hospice founded in Mexico that encompassed the full hospice philosophy that included emotional and spiritual care with physical uh, management of the illness. When we started, the morphine and critical pal uh, palliative care medications were not even available in, in San Miguel. Uh, in 2007, the Midday Rotary Club gave us a grant that allowed us to educate, reach out, and have the necessary durable equipment to run a home care hospice. That grant allowed us to set up a conference in 2008 here in San Miguel 
where we brought in over 100 healthcare professionals uh, throughout the state of Guanajuato. The uh, Secretary of Health in Guanajuato actually purchased 90% of the seats because they liked the program so much. And it was the first LNEC that we did. Hi, Sophia. What a surprise. Uh, so LNEC is the end of life nursing education curriculum. LNEC is the gold standard internationally and in the US for training new people in hospice care. Uh, after we did the LNEC there in 2011, we were invited to present LNEC and EPIC, which is the physician side of that, to the National Institute of Cancer annual meeting. Uh, with Rotary Assistance, we brought eight trainers, doctors and nurses from the U.S., and we trained more than 100 doctors and 100 nurses and social workers. All 33 cancer hospitals in Mexico were represented at that training. Uh, Mitigari was, later on, Mitigari was founded in 2016 as a continuation of the hospice movement. Uh, Rotary has continued to provide additional grants for durable me medical equipment and things that we need to run our organization. Now we're beginning to work on a new grant, a global grant, uh, for the new hospice house that we'll talk about later. And we're hoping that Rotary is going to be able to provide all the equipment and furnishings for the new building. So that's pretty good. <clears throat> so regardless on which side of the border you live on, you need to prepare yourself for medical crisis and emergencies and the end of life. Uh, Uh, the list here is not intended to be comprehensive, but I hope it can help you begin to think about the things you need to prepare regard, uh, whatever regarding whatever situation arises in your life. A frequent problem that we encounter here in San Miguel with expat is there is no plan for who is going to be the responsible person. Uh, who's going to arrange for all the details of daily life of managing an illness? Do you have someone who's ready to take on that gargantuan responsibility? Who's going to cook? Who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to hire the caretakers? Who's going to feed the pet? To manage all of that is a gargantuan task, and you need to have someone in place ready who knows, who knows you, knows what you want, knows where your documents are, has access to your credit cards. There are many things that you need to do and you need to prepare ahead of time. And this is regardless, you know, it doesn't matter whether you live in Mexico or the United States, these things come up and, and it's wise to think about them ahead of time. <clears throat> For us in San Miguel, and this, this has happened frequently, if, a, if we get a call for uh, someone who needs hospice care, and they don't have anybody who can stand up and be the responsible person, we can't take them. And so they are, you know, they, you've got to have someone who's gonna stand with you. Uh, we're very excited about the new hospice house because that will allow us to put people in a safe place and give them care when otherwise we're not allowed to do it. Uh, it's also very important to have a doctor who you know, who you trust, and who really has an idea of what you want uh, in a medical emergency or at the end of life. Uh, part of all of that is uh, an advanced directive. You've probably heard about it. You probably don't have one. Uh, it is a very important document that will guide people to be sure you can get the care you want when you can't speak for yourself. One document that we use here at hospice to help with the preparation of an advanced direction is the five wishes. This is a wonderful, wonderful document. I've got a few up here uh, in English and some in Spanish. They cost 100 pesos each, that's what we pay for them. Or you can download them uh, at www.fivewishes.org. Uh, 
for $5 also. But I, I strongly recommend that you use this document or something similar to try to figure out how you want to be treated in different situations. Uh, so if you own real estate in Mexico, you must have a will, or else your, your, um, your property will get held up in probate for a very long period of time, and it will be very difficult to sort out. Uh, avoid probate in all, uh, if you can. It's expensive, it's slow. Uh, for your financial accounts in Mexico, you can go and name a beneficiary to those accounts. So if you die, as soon as, you, as uh, the beneficiary gets the Mexican death certificate, they can have access to those funds, funds that may be necessary to clear up and finalize uh, the, the last parts of your financial obligations. Uh, if your primary beneficiaries live out of the country, the U.S. Consul is authorized to seal your house uh, until your beneficiaries come down here and they can manage your situation. This is really important. I have seen so many times that someone dies, the house is sort of left there, and over the course of a few weeks, it just systematically, everything goes away. So uh, I suggest that you ask the consul to seal your house until people can get here and manage the, the situation. Uh, <clears throat> another thing people forget to do that's very important, take care of your employees. Uh, a disgruntled employee can do more to make things fall apart than anyone else uh, involved in your death. You need to write down the starting date of your employee and the weekly salary, and you need to make a, in your will, or not in your will, but in your letter of instructions, you should have a letter of instructions to people to say how you want your assets dispersed after your death, but in that letter state specifically that you want your employees to receive the full benefit according to the law in Mexico and you can leave them a bonus if you want. But so many times I've seen people come down here, families come down, that they don't have the empathy, they don't understand the depth of our relationships and our friendships here in San Miguel. And they come down and they take all the money and leave, and the employees are left with nothing. And it's just, it's wrong, and it's up to us to be sure that our employees and our friends get what they deserve. Um, so the, dying in Mexico is not any more complicated than dying in the United States, except in the 48 hours after you die. <laughs> and that's complicated and that's difficult. Uh, the people who are your survivors are confused, they're feeling grief, they're, it's a really, really difficult time. And so I suggest, strongly suggest, if you take one piece of advice from me today, is go get a burial plan. Uh, I know two companies that do it in San Miguel, the 24 Hour Association and Nuevo Jardín, Jardín is Nuevo or De Vida. Uh, <clears throat> so what will happen, they will pick up the body, they'll arrange for the doctor to certify the death, They'll execute your burial and cremation wishes. They'll deal with local authorities. They'll get you the Mexican death certificate. With that, they go to the U.S. or Canadian consul to manage the death of a citizen abroad process. They will turn in your passport, your immigration papers, cancel your social security claims, and all of those details. Those are all details we don't know how to do, and they're all details that are confusing and difficult, and particularly more so if that person doesn't have Spanish. So, uh, relieving your distraught and grieving family from the burden of those obligations is, in my opinion, the greatest gift you can leave 
uh, at the time of your death. Uh, so really, administratively, dying in Mexico is not particularly complicated, and you can, with confidence, you can choose Mexico, your home, as a place that you stay to die. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the medical side of dying in Mexico. My dear friend, Dr. Tejeda, will come up and do that. Sorry, but I'm a teeny person. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you for allowing us today and share this important talk about the end of your lives, our lives, and how do you want to manage. So this is not a commercial, but we are your opportunity and we are your best choice. Why? Why we are here? We are here because, because we want to share with all of you the meaning to Give me a second. This is an advance that my board president will be shared with you. Oh, about my part, yes. Here, to redefine in hospice care in Mexico. And our commitment to hospice care reflects a paradigm shift in the way we approach life's final chapter. And I am honored to share with you the strides we have made and the promising future that await us. In Mexico, in Mexico, the essence of hospice care has taken a new meaning. One defined it by warm, empathy, and a deep understanding of the unique needs of those facing life-limiting illnesses. Louder. Today, I am thrilled to announce that not only do we do provide hospice care with unwavering compassion, but we have also reached a milestone where our services are complete by medical equipment and a comprehensive and array of medications. We are able to provide all kinds of medication at the end of life, all kinds with the best quality. But in Mitigare, the best part, it is his team, absolutely the team. Of highly qualified, we are highly qualified, sensitive, empathetic, and compassionate professionals who provide the highest quality care. We are training in the best centers of Mexico, uh, the birth centers of Mexico and the US also, and Europe, because I went to France and I took a course about palliative care and how the European people understand the palliative and the hospice care, and was amazing. Definitely our commitment to excellent extents beyond the current horizon, absolutely. In the coming months, we eagerly anticipate the inauguration of the new facility, as my poor president can talk to you in a few minutes, and embodiment our dedication to enhancing the quality of life for individuals and, for individuals and their families during the final stage of their journey. This state-of-the-art building set to open its doors in September. So keep an, uh, your eye, set your date, save the date for us. So this facility will serve us as a light of hope to all of us, absolutely. Providing a comfort, care, and dignity at the end of your life. Our mission? Absolutely, is to, to redefine the narrative of hospice care in Mexico 
The facility we envision will not merely be a building. It will be a sanctuary, a place where compassionate care meets cutting edge medical support, a place where every individual, irrespective of their circumstances, can find solace and support as they traverse the path toward the end of life. Definitely our success is owed to the unwavering support of each person present here today. Thank you so much. And countless others who believe in the transformative power of hospice care. Your support fuels our determination to create a paradigm of care that not only meets the physical needs of our patients, but also nurtures their emotional and so spiritual well-being. This is part of our project. And I want to do an important reflection today, because the best part of Mitigare Cuidados Paliativos is not who leads, or it's not who is the leader in the medical or in the administration team. Absolutely the best part is the team. Because they are, we are the leader, but they are the soul of the project. And this is our team. We have nurses, we have doctors, Dr. Vasquez, Dr. Omar, Dr. Leon, and we have social workers, spiritual supports, volunteers. It's a very important part of us, volunteers. So today we are invite you, if someone wants to become a volunteer from hospice, you will be welcome. And thanatology, caretakers, it's a very important part. So Lee was talking about the training, and we are working hard in training people in all the medical areas, doctors, nurses, social workers, volunteers, caretakers, and caregivers also. And of course, we have a medical director. So in this moment, I am the medical director. So why? We are the best option in all the country because our team is a very uh, qualified team and we have the sense of compassion and, uh, and our duty is to provide the best quality possible for all of you and your loved ones. So, in conclusion, I invite you all to be part of this remarkable journey, a journey that celebrates life, celebrates life, dignity, and the profound impact of compassionate care. Because I think, and I truly believe, in, I, I am a truly believer about the and I think that together let us usher a new era of hospice care in Mexico. One where every life is honored and every journey is accompanied by the warmth and compassion. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And now let me introduce my board, my current board president, Mr. Lee, Les, Lee, Les Matthews. Well, I think you can glean from uh, Dr. Tejeda's uh, talk here how incredibly fortunate we are in San Miguel to have her team, um, and this being the first uh, true hospice program in all of Mexico. 
As Carla mentioned earlier, I was involved for a number of years in hospice care in the U.S. And there's 5,500 hospices in the United States and about 700 across Canada. And we have the only one in Mexico right here in San Miguel. So <laughs> really remarkable. So I want to talk to you just uh, briefly about our new building uh, that is about 50% finished now. We plan to have it uh, op a grand opening for it in September. It's, on, it's across the street from the entrance to the Botanical Garden on Cuesta San Jose, if you sort of know that part of town. It's, it's going to be a beautiful facility, as you'll see. A couple of things that um, we're doing as part of this new facility, as you'll see over on the far left, we have three inpatient rooms. And as both Lee and Dr. Tejeda mentioned, we've discovered over the years that uh, many people here in San Miguel, uh, we've not been able to take care of in uh, hospice care at, on the home because they don't have somebody that can be an in-house caregiver. 85% or so of all of our um, patients up until this point here in San Miguel have been um, Mexicans. But the other 15%, the Anglos here, Many of us don't have family members that can help take care in coordination with the uh, hospice team. So that's why we decided to do these three inpatient rooms. So beginning in next fall, we will have a place for uh, certainly Mexicans, but by and large, their families uh, are large enough that there's people to take care of them. So it's the older Anglo community, the Anglo community here that many times don't have that as, uh, additional help. The other thing we did here, which I think is uh, somewhat remarkable, is we were approved last year uh, to get uh, US Medicare to pay for the med eligible Medicare recipients to be in, in inpatient care here in this hospice program. So obviously also a first. <laughs> it's clearly a first here in Mexico. But the, uh, the new facility is going to have, uh, obviously, offices, some training facilities to it, some training parts to it, uh, and then the in-care in patient uh, beds. We're especially proud of this new facility. As you can see here, it's beautiful. And I like to refer to it as an amazing public-private partnership here in San Miguel. A little over a year ago, we received a challenge grant from the Foundation for Hospice Care in the U.S. that they would uh, be, do the initial funding for this new facility if we could get the city of San Miguel to donate the land to put it on. And to huge efforts by Dr. Tejeda and Lee, and thanks so much to uh, Sofia Alvarez, who's here with the NGO office for the city. Uh, last fall, we received this uh, land grant, if you will, from the city on the property that I described. It's a 1,500 square meter uh, piece of property. And so the first phase of this building, the, everything to the left is under construction now. The right-hand side of this is gonna be our new training facility that we will begin construction on over the next year or two. And that's gonna have a classroom that can accommodate up to about 50 people and our goal here is to do training for hospice care providers throughout all of Mexico, not just here in San Miguel. So we will be sort of the uh, benchmark of hospice care in all of Mexico. And most of the people that wanna be in hospice care will be trained here at this new facility in, in uh, San Miguel. As you can imagine, uh, the main differences between hospice care in Mexico and in uh, uh, the U.S., Canada, and Europe is in every place but Mexico, there's federal reimbursement for uh, hospice care. Here, uh, we don't have that, at least as of right now. So uh, we take on all patients, uh, irrespective of their ability to pay. We do a financial analysis. Uh, the uh, uh, vast majority of our patients pay about 2,000 pesos a month for hospice care with us. Um, so we're continually in a fundraising mode, obviously. In our new facility, uh, and I just wanted to show you a few slides to show you that this, this is really for real. Uh, 
that we have several fundraising opportunities. We have naming rights, we have nine rooms still available with naming rights. These rooms are between 20 square meters and 30 square meters. Uh, we have a, a, a wall of honor uh, plaques that you can use for donations. And on each of your seats when you came in, you had these um, little cards here. So if you're interested in learning more about our donation opportunities, we would really appreciate it if you could fill out the cards and give them to any of us. Also in the very back of the room, we have the scale model of our new building. And so we'll be back there uh, at the end of the presentations for you to see that. Uh, I think it's pictures a thousand words here and to answer any of your questions. Uh, so without further ado, I think there are some questions and, and we'd be happy to, uh, to answer those. Questions? Thanks again for a great presentation, Les and Lee and Dr. Tejeda. Um, I guess this question is more for Dr. Tejeda because it involves the Mexican community. Um, as you know better than anybody else, there's always been a cultural um, reluctance on the part of the Mexican community because they're so family oriented. And they prefer that their moms and dads and grandparents die at home. Uh, do you expect with this new facility and the grants that we have, more Mexicans will be open to having their families days in the hospice facility. I am praying for that, David, but I am pretty sure that will be a reality. But I have to say that we, can, we are able to keep the both uh, ways to treat in hospice and palliative care, that we can allow three patients, but we also can keep the medical visits at home. But yes, we are uh, working hard to break the myths about the hospice care in the Mexican culture. Is there room to expand uh, to, for more than three beds yes, in the future? That, that's a great question, actually, if I can. Questions? I don't see any hands. No questions? Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just get back to the floor plan here. We have, uh, it's not really showing here, but there's a fairly large garden area to the left of where these three patient rooms are. So our game plan would be if in fact we need to have more inpatient rooms, there's certainly a place there to build another three um, and, and perhaps more. These patient rooms are also quite large and so a patient could be there and a couple of family members, there's room for even a family member or two to spend the night with the patient in the facility. And just so you know, in the U.S., a very small fraction of the 5,500 hospices in the U.S., a small fraction of people actually that are, die in hospice care, which is over half the people today on Medicare that die in the U.S. die in hospice care, which is pretty amazing and a very small percentage of that die in these inpatient facilities. People still want to die at home. Sure. There was a question by internet yesterday. We received a question yesterday by internet from someone who, the question was basically, I don't live in Centro, do you travel? So can you talk a little bit about our range of service? Yes, absolutely. If you are living out of town, even in the communities, we can go. We can go to your place. We can set up the medical plan. And we can train your family to be uh, ready just in case you need anything in the middle of the night or in the early hours so they can act. Uh, how can I say what? And while I can come or any other member of the staff. But yes, absolutely, we can go to your place. Yeah. One of the exciting things about having the new hospice house is there are five, as most of you know, there are 500 communities in the municipality of San Miguel. 
And some of those communities are really, really isolated and away, and they basically have no medical service whatsoever, hospice or regular medical care. But with this new facility, those people who are so far out, who suffer the most, they can come in and they can be in the hospice house and they can be treated there. Ron? One online question is, can a patient decide to end his or her own life in Mexico, and how would that be done? So I guess that's meaning, can you just go ahead and say, I'm through, and can receive assistance in ending one's own life? And the second question, let me just ask it together, is, are there any resources in San Miguel to help someone who is failing but has no apparent support system? Okay, the failing thing is a real problem, and Sofia Alvarez deals with that frequently, that we have people here that just don't have a support. They're not necessarily dying, but they don't have anybody to take care of them, and basically there's no good answers. Sofia works hard to get them care and get them taken care of, uh, but it's a very, very complicated situation. And the first question, Oh, assisted suicide, euthanasia. We don't, don't we, we are not able to do that. But if you are a patient who is in a terminal or even in the end of your life, absolutely we can set up a plan, call it about the law, the Mexican law, as a palliative sedation or terminal palliative sedation. That is a procedure, it's not an act. What is the difference between, between euthanasia and palliative sedation? The intention and the dose. Because with the palliative sedation, we treat the symptoms we treat the patient and we work with the family if the patient has, absolutely. But it's not uh, assisted suicide, it's not euthanasia, it's called palliative sedation or even terminal palliative sedation. It depends how many symptoms and the symptom that the patient has had or probably because the illness is probably to have it. So, yes, we can help you, not with assisted suicide, but just with a medical procedure. Thank you. Uh, one more question? Okay, we, we've run out of time. So we're going to stand back here by the model for a little while after the meeting today, so sure. please come back and take a look and ask any questions you have. We have a sign-up sheet here, uh, so if you're interested in volunteering, you're interested in donating, you're interested in being on our mailing list, please sign up. And thank you as a volunteer. Yep. And thank you very much for coming.